<clears throat> just know that you need to go ahead and register for those. So do we have any questions at this time, Erin? Not yet. No questions. Okay, guys, it's your opportunity to go ahead and ask some questions. We're here for you. Any questions coming up that you might have? Remember, before you come to a build workshop, you need to make sure that you've done as much as possible, or a load workshop, as much as possible through validation of your information. You may run into a validation error that you do not know how to correct before that. If you do, go ahead and log a ticket with the school, and that validation error send that ticket to the help desk, and then once you get that ticket number back, just go ahead and email Erin and I, and we'll try to take a look at it and give you help as we can. Remember, there are only two of us now, so we're going to be dependent on the service desk to help us out a lot with these. April and May, we will be out in the field, so don't, don't give up on us. We'll get back to you eventually. Okay. Um, have you heard from any dis districts who say their courses are disappearing from their course groups? I think that's because they came into the course group and forgot to select current catalog. Have you heard about that? That is quite possible. The first thing you do when you log into course group is you must select current catalog. So you need to start from the middle of that page, work to the top, and then pick your courses. You're going to select current catalog. You're going to select the current school only. Give that group a name, and then go down to the bottom and pick your courses. Right, load only, are you able to change the periods in the school day? We had a big issue last year with lunch periods. First off, lunch periods should not be scheduled at all. Uh, North Carolina does not use lunch periods for scheduling, so that's not instructional time. They do not get scheduled. Um, as far as changing your periods, I'm not sure what you're asking. I may need a little bit more information on that. Uh, before you load your students, you can make any changes to that master schedule you need to. Once those students are loaded, it becomes a little bit more difficult to make those changes, but do not schedule lunch. A middle school schedule using the build and load like the high school students? Most definitely. You can, middle schools can do that. That's not a problem. As long as you have your pre-scheduling information set up, you should be ready to go and do the build and load. Patricia says she had that problem after they added courses. They were disappearing overnight. Added courses? To that, um, catalog to the course group? Yeah. Hmm. I don't know about that. You may, since the group was already established, and then you just selected a course, an additional course to be in that group, I'm not sure. You may want to send in a ticket with an example of what course you added with a print screen, and the next day what courses disappeared from that group so that we can see the print screens and, and know what's, try to, try to troubleshoot what's going on. Um, that usually happens just when you establish the group to begin with. No, it says we have a high school offering what they're calling dual courses next year. They have combined two courses and team teaching them simultaneously during the same period year long. They want it as one section giving one combined grade. What course code should I have them use so that all the necessary exams are triggered? I can tell you that you can't do that. It is one content at a time. 
Now you can offer them on opposite rotation days, and you can set up a constraint to do that so they have one course on A day and one course on B day. And at the end of the day, if it's two teachers in there full time, they can just break up that time however they need to. But in the computer, it's going to have to be different sections. A student cannot be assigned two contents at the same time, so same term and period. So year-long period one, A day, I can only do one content. I can't be in two classes at the same time. And for triggering exams, there is not a course code at this time that would do that. You need to have the two separate course codes to trigger the proper exams unless you get something from C&I that would do that. And then the question would become, was that NOLA? NOLA, um, how many credits is, are, are the students going to get for that one course? One credit or two credits because they're actually completing two courses. So I think it's going to have to be separate course numbers. Judy asks, where are the instructions for steps to complete copying the master schedule so she can go ahead and make changes? That workbook is available on PowerSource. You're looking for the Power Scheduler Load Process Workbook. Is there a way to print teacher recommendations? Not that we know of yet. We have been looking and have not found a way to do that. I know that there's a ticket in on that, and Service Desk has been working on that, but at this point we have not found a way to print teacher recommendations. Is there any way to rank order of our electives or alternates? Ginger, you can, you can prioritize your alternates, but you cannot prioritize the other classes. That's all part of the magic that the load engine does. So you only prioritize alternates if you want to. It's not necessary. Keep the questions coming. They've been pretty good so far. Our terms per period will not calculate automatically for our AP courses when we set the period per meeting and frequency to one. Read that again. Our terms per period. Terms per period isn't a thing, so I think we've got a cross-up of, of lingo going on here. Yeah. You should set your periods per meeting to one and your frequency, and that should give you periods per cycle. Is that what you're talking about, Jane? Is this what you're talking about, Jane? I've got it on the screen. Periods per cycle, where you have periods per meeting set to what to whatever it is and frequency set to whatever it is. That should automatically count your periods per uh, cycle. Ginger wants to know how to prioritize alternate requests. All right, Ginger, we're going to go to our scheduler. We're going to pick a student. Let's see if we can find a student that has some requests in here. I'm going to look at his requests. Ta-da! There they are. And what you would need to do is find a request that's checked as an alternate. So Sue Ann's just going to change that visual arts to an alternate. Then in the priority box, you would put a number, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 10, 20, 30, 40, 
low number means high priority. So whatever numbers you use, be consistent. One would be the first alternate try, two would be the second, three the third, and so on. Okay. Jane says she's talking about the terms per year. Terms per year should automatically calculate after you put terms in the box. That doesn't have anything to do with the periods per meeting and frequency. You must enter valid terms right here, Jane in order for it to create the terms per year. We offer semester and year long of most core subjects. Is it wise to use the global substitution feature to ensure the core classes are scheduled successfully? No, not really. You need to, if you do global substitution, <clears throat> what's going to happen is it's going to try to fit a, if you use a year long and a semester, it's going to try to fit a semester course into a year long or a year long into a semester. If you have your request coded properly without the E or without the checkbox and the E, that ensures that your core courses are scheduled before the electives or the alternates. So what you would do is make sure, just like on that one student I just had, see how his electives or his alternates have a code? None of his core courses or required courses have that code. This ensures that those are scheduled before anything with the code or the, or the checkbox. And Ginger just asked a good follow-up to those alternate priorities. The students have no capacity to prioritize their own alternates. So if you want to use those, an administrative user has to go back and enter that priority. It it's is not required. It's very important, though, that this piece with the elective, the E, is put in here and that the checkbox is there. That's very, very important step. Is there a report that shows the percentage of students completed course requests? There are two reports inside Power Scheduler to help you, and Sue Ann will show you those right now. If you'll go to Power Scheduler to the bottom and click on Reports, you have um, Student Request Tally. And what's the other one? Let's see. Uh, request by student. Yeah, Request by student. Oh, there it is, request by student. If you print that, and let's just do those 400 students here, this shows you the student and their actual request. If we go back to scheduling reports and student request tally, this actually shows you the student's name, how many primaries he has, how many alternates he has, so this is a good report for that. You just have to keep in mind, um, if you don't have your eighth graders brought up yet, you're going to have a lot of zeros and things like that. So those are two good reports in order for you to show that. On the student tally report, can you export to CSV for manipulating data, or can you sort that report? The report itself, I'm not sure, can be sorted. Yeah, huh? yeah, but it gets in my way over there. So you actually can sort on the total, 
So you get all your totals at the top or all your primaries at the top. You can, and by student name. So you can sort that report. Um, there is no export here, but you could copy it and paste it into a... Um, if you paste that into Excel because yeah. it's a, a table in the web rendering, it works pretty well, yeah. and you'll get the data there and you can manipulate it that way. But it is a sortable report. I wasn't sure. How do we decide if we want to use load only or build and load? That is a decision that you as a school and your scheduling team are going to have to make. The difference between a build and load and a load only. A build and load is a true student-driven schedule. It takes the requests. It takes the assignments that you've given to the teachers. Let's just say Mrs. Smith teaches two algebras not a section, not a semester or a term or anything like that. It takes the requests, it looks at all the information for assignments, all the students, all the requests, and it puts the schedule the best way it can to fulfill student needs. A load is copying your master schedule from last year, loading your students into it. Doesn't take into consideration any changes that have been made to the student population, any changes to requests or anything like that. It just It's a teacher-driven schedule, basically, because you're assigning students based on what the teachers taught and what section, semester, term, day, and period they had it last year. So you've got to determine what is the best for your school population. Julie says we have four lunches, A, B, C, and D, so their periods are one, two, three, 33, 34, 35 to incorporate lunches and then period four. So the student schedule did not read in order one, two, three, then the 30s, then four. It went in numeric order. And second, they could accrue more than one absence if they had one of the split periods. So the absence part is easiest to talk about, but your course is split into multiple periods and you do meeting attendance. Each period is a separate meeting and it's a own separate attendance entry. You're just going to have to filter what you look at to discount that doubling, but it's true. It's just part and parcel to using split periods. As far as the order of the schedules, I believe in your periods, you just simply have to reorder them on the period set of schedules. Actually, when it prints in the student schedule, though, it prints by the ID order. So, Um, so it prints, when you print their schedule, it prints in the ID order of the period. Should I set up NCVPS courses to build, or should I wait to see if the cross-enroll function is available? That's going to be up to you. Um, I, I don't know what to tell you because I don't know when that's going to be available. Um, I, it, it's going to have to be a decision you make. A lot of it depends on how many VPS courses you have, too. Um, you know, once you get them scheduled, it would be easy to pick them as a group and cross-enroll them and then just delete that information out. I, it's just totally up to you. That's, and I know that's not a good answer, but I, I can't make that decision or we can't make that decision for you because we don't know a timeline or we don't know your student population in order to say, you know, if you've got 12 kids, I would wait. If you've got 500 kids, I'm not sure I would wait. Um, it's a decision you're going to have to make. Judy, I'm reading your follow-up question. I'm not sure I understand it. You're looking for instructions for steps to correct the glitch with term year versus scheduling year. Can you give us a little more information there? We're not Can following. You unmute her and let her ask on the phone. Judy, you're Judy. Okay. Hello? Hello, Judy? Can you hear me? We yep. can. Okay, great. Um, so, Ann, in your demonstration at Symposium, 
in the power scheduler part, you showed us where there was um, up in the right hand corner where it says year, you know, it lists the year, the semester, the term. There was some kind of glitch you said that was, I thought you said it was specific to North Carolina where we have to go in and correct something to get, force the system to show the correct year, the schedule, correct scheduling year. Correcting the scheduling year. What you have to do, this is when you first build your scenario, okay? So when your scenario is there, what happens when you first build it is this says full year. You actually have to go here to years and terms, and it'll say full year here. You're going to click on it, and you're going to make it say 2015-2016. Make it say 15-16 for the abbreviation. Then you're going to go to functions, scroll to the bottom, and click set schedule year. That's not specific to North Carolina. That's Power School. Is that what you were talking about? Yes, I think so. Thank you. Then after you copy your master schedule, you've got to do that whole process all over again because it reverts if you're copying your master schedule. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. All right, we have no questions coming up, so come on, guys. Up to you, Aaron. You've got anything you need to add? No, I got it all out last week. <laughs> what happens when I'm not here? This is your time to ask those questions. Again, we're going to try to get a, a document done up with all these questions and answers that Aaron has done. Notice I said try because there's two of us. So we're doing our best. Just to confirm, on a load, valid terms are mandatory, but valid periods are not. Yes, each, each course needs valid terms, but start periods can be left blank if any period is fine. If we want to copy the master schedule, but not load, do we put that in the live side or in power scheduler? Totally up to you. If you're not going to load, not going to build, you can copy on the live side after EOI. If it's an elementary school, a lot of elementary schools do do that. Just copy on the live side after EOI. Sheila's got a good question. So students that would take the same course both semesters, so more than one time in the year. The course only shows up once on the request screen. It can only, and thus can only be selected once. Is there a way the student can select a course more than once? If it's a different number, yes. But on your request screens, you also have a thing down here that says number of requests to generate. So you have to be very, very careful with this, okay? If you're going to do that, that course needs to truly be in a group 
by itself so that you generate two requests for it, such as band. We know that students can take beginning band for four years if they need to. If you have it set up as a semester course, then you're going to say possibly they request it once, but when it generates a request, it creates two requests. The safest way to do it is to have two separate numbers for that course and allow them to request it two times, adding the three characters that you're allowed to add somehow, whatever makes sense to you. And if you get hit by a bus tomorrow, whatever makes sense to somebody else. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, Nicole says, last year they said we had to copy the master schedule before EOY. Uh, I'm not sure who said that. Are you, what, what grade level are we talking about? If you, you can copy it before EOY. You can copy it into Power Scheduler and then just commit it back to the live site. That's okay. You can do that. You can copy it into the master, uh, Power Scheduler make any changes you need, but you have to remember to commit that schedule back if you copy it into Power Scheduler. Do you remember who told you you couldn't, you had to copy it before EOI? And were you copying on the live side or into Power Scheduler? If you're using Power Scheduler, that is correct. It must be copied before EOI. Power Scheduler is future years. So after EOI, Power Scheduler will be for year 16-17, not 15-16. said that came from a Pearson training. Um. We'll make a note and go ask and see if anybody hears about that, and we can put something out. Neither one of us remember it that way, but, you know. All right. Need some more questions. Nancy has where can I find a checklist of things needed before I attend the load workshop? Well, there's a couple places. That checklist that we sent out when we did the Prepare to Schedule workshop, also within Power Scheduler, there is a checklist right here. So you need to make sure that all of this is completed before you get to the build and load and commit part. I suggested to my classes that they actually have their data managers or whoever's working on this process check the boxes, started, in the middle of, completed, and put a date here. Totally up to you all, but it's a good resource within Power Scheduler itself that, that you have. Um, but if you need that checklist, if you'll send Aaron or I an email, we'll be glad to get you the checklist that we had that we gave out. Nicola, should we delete our 1415 course requests, or is it fine to leave them there? I, 
I'm not sure why you would want to delete them because they're in 1415. They should not be appearing in 1516 power scheduler at all. But and Patricia is asking, year-round schools can copy master schedule to 1516 and work on it in next year. So let's just be clear here. In you can copy the schedule to Power Scheduler anytime you want. You can only copy it on the live side after EOY. It is our recommendation that you only copy it after EOI if you're going to work it on the live side because if you copy it now and you start working in 15, 16, you've got to make sure that whoever's doing that work is doing it in the correct term. They start deleting things. They're going to delete them in 14, 15. They're going to mess 14, 15 up. So it is our recommendation that you copy that master schedule into Power Scheduler, work on it there, even if you're not going to put kids in it, commit it back to the live side before EOY or wait till after EOY and copy your master schedule then. You run a very high risk of messing up 1415 if you copy it and do it now on the live side. If a middle school wanted students to be able to select only electives, can this happen? If so, what do they need to set up? Sure. You can go ahead and put everything in, just like you're going to, to build. Put those requests in, and then you'll load those students. They'll only load the electives because that's all they have scheduled. But you'll want to make sure that your core courses are checked to schedule so when you commit back to the live side, or when you drop students in, that those courses will commit back to the live side. Any other way, Aaron? Yep. Just like a normal load, except you only request the electives and only only use the engine for that part. All right. Any more questions? Keep them coming. They've been pretty good. Remember to go ahead, if you've got a question after these webinars, to log a ticket. Got to log a ticket. Once you've logged that ticket and gotten that number and you need Aaron and I to help, go ahead and send us an email with that ticket number in there. We've got some people on the service desk who are certified. Should be able to help you without a problem since there's only two of us. So, But we'll keep working on it. We'll get back to you just as quick as we can. When will we see the dates of the build workshops? So those are posted now. Um, they just went out yesterday. Yesterday. Let me show you where else you can look. Go ahead, Aaron. And you can find those on the NCSIS website under training, either in the calendar view or in the course list. And the course list is by region. And on the calendar, it's, of course, by date. Right here on the very first page, sign up for scheduling workshops now. Build and load only. Click on that. That takes you right to the build and load workshop. There are the regional links. Okay. Scroll on down. We should have load workshops somewhere down here. Here are your load workshops and the regional links for those. Again, remember it is one build and load per LEA. 
with one school. Four people from that school can come. It is one load per LEA, one school, and up to four people can come with that load team. Coordinator needs to sign up for those. You should have all requests in and be validated as far as you can get before you come to these workshops. If you have a problem with validation, you get an error that you cannot resolve, let us know. Log a ticket with that error information in the school, and we'll get back to you just as quick as we can. Remember, keep in mind that the coordinator is the one who can log that ticket. So if you've got a problem, make sure you email all the correct information to her. The who, the what, the when, the where, the why, and the how. Kind of like an English essay when you write up that information. The who, the what, the when, the where, the why, the how. Oh, him or her. And let them get that information to the service desk. If you will remember, we'd like to have you sign up by the end of next week, okay? It says here, initial sign-up will run from March the 6th, and I know we got that out a little bit late, but through March the 20th. After March the 20th, if there are seats available, we're, we may open that up to one more school and may open it up so you can cross regions, but... We will be sending out more information about that after next Friday. So watch that NCSIS website and the NCDPI email for more information about that. We want to make sure that we allow everybody the opportunity to sign up within their region before we start crossing regions. That's the way the seats were set up, was based on the number of schools and the, the level of schools in that region. Um, that was before Erin and I took over, so we we'll want to make sure that we get all that properly done before we open it up and have people in a certain region who cannot get to their own scheduling workshop. So just make sure you tell your people and anybody else you know out there, cross regions, to go ahead and get signed up. You may want to put that out on your Google chat. Make sure you sign up for your region before next Friday. We have no more questions coming. We've got 22 of the 36 people that initially signed up for this webinar, so keep them coming. If we don't get a lot within the next 15 minutes, we'll probably call it at an hour again today. Questions have been pretty good so far. Keep in mind that these build workshops, where they were four days last year, are only two days this year. That's why it's imperative that you have all this information done before you get there. There will be two of us in a classroom with seven of you. So, yeah, seven schools. So it's going to be a little bit tight, but um, that's why it's imperative that you have all of the up through the validation done before you come to that workshop. We will not have time in that two days to sit down and do everything. Hopefully, you can get really, really far 
on your build, but we will not guarantee you that you will leave with a full master schedule. teacher recommendations, they do not have access to the 1516 catalog. Is there something we need to do? I don't know of any way that you can give them access to that 1516 catalog. I know course numbers have changed. So I, I really, we can check on it and see, but at this point, I have not heard of a way that you can give them access to that 1516 catalog. I know it makes it a little more difficult when the course numbers change like that. Ginger says, when we copied over our master schedule, we had AP English 3 with the 1415 code. Now we have a different course code, and I see it under sections to add sections. So did the master schedule and the power schedule said drop the other sections from my master schedule automatically? No. no. What you'll have to do is go activate that old course code momentarily so then it shows up in your courses list. You'll then be able to see those sections in either change them or delete them. It should show up in red is the color that it's going to show up in, the, the old number that you activate. Um, once you activate it again, it will show up in red on your course catalog. Which we all know if you have courses that show up in red, you need to take care of everything that's associated with those courses because they will not commit back to the live side. So here's also something you can do, Aaron, Ginger, sorry, I'm not sure where Aaron came from, he's sitting here beside me. In Power Scheduler, when you reactivate that old course, you can go to that old course homeroom just happens to be one I picked. Click on sections. Of course it doesn't have any sections associated with it. There may not be any within this database. But here, you click on that section and you can actually associate, should be able to, the new course number there. Okay, so you can't do it on courses. You have to do it through teacher. My bad. Go to teacher, pick a teacher, and watch me pick one that has no sections. On her schedule, oh, look there. Click on sections, and here you can associate that new number to those sections. So when you reactivate that course, if you look at the teachers who are teaching it, if the same teachers are teaching the new number, you can go to those teachers, click on associate on each section and, and associate the new number with it. And it should then take it out of that old course number. 
in Power Scheduler is the only place that you can do that. Not on the live side. Power Scheduler only. You can also use that trick if you course request and load with an old number, like if you miss one, or you're using it as a placeholder waiting on the new number, something like that. Before you commit, you can just change it on the sections and then commit with the new number over. So helpful trick. Yeah, helpful trick. Very, very helpful. Ginger, you get a gold star for questions today. A whole email full and that one. That's a good little trick right there if you copy your master schedule. A lot of people don't know on the power scheduler side. On the live side, of course, you have to take the kids out, create the new course, create new sections, that whole process. On the power scheduler side, you can just associate the new course number to the section on the teachers. So when working with teachers to change course code under 15, 16 year, or do you do under 14, 15? We're in power scheduler, right. so there's no, I mean, you're only working in, in the scheduling right. year. Mm -hmm. right. You only, have to do that in power scheduler. Right. You're only working in the 15, 16 year within power scheduler itself. Do you notice up here it says start page power scheduler? Do not do that on the live side at all. Oh, Sue Ann's screen is confusing because this scenario hasn't been set ahead. It says fourteen fifteen because this scenario is Let me not set what? for fifteen sixteen. In your stuff, the scheduling year and power scheduler will be fifteen sixteen. That's where it's done. I'll go ahead and create a scenario here. Well, she, while she does that, feel free to type your question. Definitely tell you're getting further in the process. Keep in mind as I do this, you notice it didn't change at the top, so let me go back to here now. I need to bring my mouse up here with me. Yeah, so it shouldn't. It's what it should say is fifteen sixteen up here. And then I would have to. I mean, it should say full year up here. Here now, I need to go to here and change this to fifteen sixteen two thousand fifteen sixteen and this to 15-16. Now I need to go to the bottom and set my schedule year. It was just a little out of sync, but so set schedule year 15-16. Mm -hmm. Ginger's asking, what's the yeah. easiest way to make those inactive courses available again? 
edit your course catalog. You'll go to um, your unavailable courses. You should find them there. Put a check mark on them. Scroll to the bottom and click Submit. They should then appear on your live side of available courses. You notice all my courses are in red. That's because at the LEA, I bet there's not a year and term set up for 15-16. Let's see. That's completed. Now I need to go to the school itself and do years and terms. So Judy's saying that the load process workbook is 70 pages, which is probably true. Probably about right. And she says when she attended a workshop last year, the presenter used a shorter document to guide them through the steps. So do you need the 70-page document? The materials that you want and that you bring are up to you. The, the book details every step of the process, whereas the checklist, which most of them are also available on PowerSource, are just an overview. So whichever you feel comfortable with, you know, whatever's the best choice for you. Also, keep in mind that book goes over several different ways to do each process. So you have to kind of weed through that book. Um, I'm not sure what the presenter you had last year gave you. We used the 70-page book last year in all the classes that I went to. Now you see that I fixed all of the information. All of my courses were in red. Now the only thing that I have in red is this one course that was unavailable because it was something wrong with it, and I made it active again. It still shows up in red. It may have had an end date or something like that. That's how you can use it and then make sure before you commit back to the live side you've taken care of everything that has to do with that course because it will not commit anything that's connected to it back to the live side. My course catalog, every course was in red because the LEA did not have a years and terms set up. Neither did the school itself have years and terms set up. So I created that went back and set my schedule year one more time and that corrected all my courses for 1516. I'm going to give it about another 10 or 15 minutes and if we have no more questions, we're going to call it a day. Questions have been really, really good today. More detail. The further along you get, the more questions we know you're going to have in more detail. Remember, next Wednesday we have this same webinar at 1, so you want to be sure and go ahead and sign up for that. Have your people sign up for that if you'd like to. They may have some questions or forward the questions to you, and you can go ahead and ask them. We'll do the same thing next Wednesday, 1 o'clock. 
We're hoping that this is very helpful to you. If you'd please send us a little bit of feedback so that we'll know whether it's helpful and whether you're getting the kind of information you need, if you'll just let Erin and I know so that we can, you know, make sure we continue things like this or have the opportunity to continue things like this. That would be great. getting ready to send out a, a communication to everyone on this webinar with our email addresses in it. So you all have those. Hopefully you find these helpful. Our plan right now is for the first couple days, first couple weeks in June, we're looking at having a couple two-day help sessions. If you're at a point where you're just stuck and can't go on, a um, couple two-day help sessions, first two weeks in June, um, so that you can come up here and we can actually sit around and help you get at least to a point where you can continue on. So watch for those to be posted um, if you're stuck. Um, you know, we want you to, to get as far as you can because, you know, two days is not a lot, but we can, we can at least maybe get over that hump that you're stuck on to get you moving on further. Just to clarify, each LEA can send two schools to training, one to a build and load, one to a load only, two different schools. You don't have to utilize both seats if you're not having any build or you don't want to participate in that either way, but you have two seats open to you, one in each mode. Make sure you do that by next Friday or it's going to be opened up and you may end up on the coast going to the mountains to have a build. So we just want to offer it to you in your LEA first, very restrictive to your LEA first, or your region first, not your LEA, but your region first. I know we had some issues with that last year about people not being able to get into their own region, so this is another reason why we set it up this way, so that you don't have to travel across the whole state unless you just particularly want to. Give it five more minutes, and if we don't have any questions, then we're going to have, go ahead and close out the webinar for today. like we're, we're reaching a point where we're not going to get any more. Um, so I think Aaron will just go ahead and put an end to it now. Aaron will go ahead and stop the recording.